Hello, everybody. Again, thanks for joining this Wednesday webinar, uh, WaveCloud's Wednesday Learning Webinar, this one titled Editing, Maximize Your Book Editing Experience. I appreciate, appreciate everybody joining this evening. This is our second webinar today. It's a repeat of the, of the morning topic. Um, and before we get started, I'd like to let everybody know that we're recording for playback later. So if you have to leave in the middle of it, if you like the webinar and you want to share it with another author, or you just want to review it later, uh, sometime after midnight tonight, you'll get a thank you email for attending with a link to this, uh, to this recording. Of course, I'm happy to send the slides to anybody who'd like them. I put my email address up on the screen there, bill.benorsdell at wavecloud.com. And let's just check assumptions real quick. Uh, the, the, my first assumption for tonight's webinar is that you all are planning to, or you've already self-published your book, and that you are a professional writer, not a hobbyist. Um, there are a lot of things that I could talk about uh, for hobbyists. Well, actually, I'd, I'd say this. Many of the things we're going to talk about tonight are helpful for hobbyists, um, but I'm really assuming that your goal, one of your goals for your book, is to publish it, sell many copies, make money, uh, and then lather, rinse, repeat, do it over and over and over again. Um, hobbyists typically don't go to as a great a length editing their work as professional writers do. Um, so I'm assuming our audience tonight is professional writers. I also would like to make this um, very interactive. So at any time, uh, feel free to use that question interface and, and flip me a, a quick question. I'll, I'll read it out loud. I'll read who it's from, and uh, we'll do our best to answer it for you. Um, just a quick word from our sponsor, of course. I work for WaveCloud Publishing. Um, this is not a sales pitch, and this is not a, a, a walk through how to do any of these items. This is more of a what to do and what to be aware of. We are, of course, an author services platform, an ebook store, but our number one goal is helping writers become successful authors. Uh, and that's why we like to share this information, these best practices. You know, what is everybody else in the industry doing to make their book competitive? That's the goal of these webinars. I'm joined tonight by Justin Luzader. He's an author consultant and a poet. Uh, he worked for the Pinch Literary Journal, and he's got his Master's of Fine Arts and Creative Writing. That's a, uh, I'd love to have my MFA in Creative Writing. J J Justin, welcome tonight to the, to the event. Thank you, Bill. Hello, everybody. Thanks for having me. And uh, Justin, I want to ask you, just so we can kind of get friendly tonight, tell me something about you that all of your friends know. <laughs> Okay, well, to tell everybody what I said the first time I was asked this question was, I really like Ultimate Frisbee. That seems kind of lame in retrospect. Um, see, something only my friends know about me. Uh, I love throwing dinner parties. That's I love great. To cook for people. So you're, edit you're editing your prior response, Justin. I love that. That's fantastic. So Justin is our representative editor tonight. Um, he's done a lot of editing. Uh, and we're going to go to him with some key questions, and he'll help us answer your questions as we're working through the, the presentation tonight. Uh, with, as I do with every webinar, I'm going to start with the finish. Um, I know that um, most people will pay attention to these uh, for, for the most part for the first, say, 30%, and then they doze off for the next 65%, and then when you tell them you're almost done, they pay attention again. So let me tell you the conclusion, and we'll, we'll circle back to these, and, we'll, of course, we'll talk about each of these in much more detail. Um, key point. Every book needs editing before publishing. Whether you can pay for a professional publisher or not, and I strongly suggest that you should, um, every book needs to be edited before you push it out the door for readers. And there are a number of reasons why, and we'll talk about that. You need to know the industry language around editing. And we're going to sort of summarize that in what we call the sort of the five basic levels of editing. And we'll talk about those uh, in a lot more detail. Editing can be free or nearly free, and we'll talk about how you make that happen for your book. Um, when you're editing, when you're working with, typically with a professional editor or even with a uh, family, a friend's or family member editing your work, um, we recommend using a common editing tool, and we'll talk about the most common one out there and what it looks like and what it does for you. We'll also talk about what should your expectations be about editing. Um, uh, frankly, uh, editing can be an emotional experience. Um, it's hard for authors, especially the first time they go through it. Um, and we'll talk about how you work with an editor. Um, you know, you, you want to get a contract. You want to get clear understanding. Get something in writing, if you will, that supersedes any verbal promises. 
and make sure that both parties know what they're getting out of it. And then, of course, we'll talk about what does a professional edit cost and how do I buy it. Um, so let's go ahead and get started uh, with why does this matter? Why is it important that we actually edit our work? It, it would seem obvious, but I think there may be some ideas in here that not all authors have thought about. If you're, if you're writing a piece of fiction and you've got grammar or spelling errors, you are knocking your reader out of that suspension of disbelief that you want them in. You want them in the story, imagining themselves as your character or characters, and um, breaking that that sort of that willing suspension of disbelief um, is really common when you get grammar and spelling errors that just sort of jar a reader right out of the story. But but, but editing is not all about spelling and punctuation and grammar. It's also about the content. And so, for example, the use of anachronistic words or concepts. For example, a, a touch-tone phone in the age of rotary dial, or, or maybe you've got a book that you wrote 10 years ago or 20 years ago. It's a fantastic thriller. It spans the globe. Um, uh, but in your book, the protagonist and the antagonist, it's a modern-day setting, keep ripping pages out of phone books so they can get numbers and addresses while they're on the run. Well, of course, they wouldn't do that in the age of smartphones and the Internet. So, you know, there are things that an editor can look for in a fiction book to help you make sure that um, it's not just about uh, grammar and spelling, that, but it, that your writing is clear and, and it fits its setting. Um, for nonfiction, when you've got poor editing, it really interferes with your credibility. Uh, it, it, it sort of it, it creates a lot of doubt in the reader's mind about, Really, how professional are you? How good are you at curing cancer? How good are you uh, as a nutritionist uh, helping people with diet plans? How good are you as a public speaker or a business leader? Um, also, uh, you may decide or you may find that a legal edit could be a requirement for the safety of your finances. Um, you know, if you're going to write a book, uh, a memoir, this happens particularly with memoirs, um, where you're telling not just your story but perhaps part of the story of others, um, you may want to be careful about defamation, uh, the potential for defamation claims. And so, you know, if you're doing something like that, you're going to want to make sure you go out and get a, a legal opinion from a lawyer who specializes in intellectual property and copyright and, and privacy issues and so forth. Also, if you use samples, so let's say you grab a, uh, there's a stanza of a Beatles song that you really like and it, it fits really well with the theme of your upcoming chapter and, and you like it so much you keep grabbing stanzas from Beatles songs to head off each of your chapters. Well, I can tell you that the people that own those songs uh, are going to be pretty upset and they're going to do everything they can to get your book yanked off the shelf. So um, if, you're, if you've got items where you need permissions, uh, uh, permission to use them, quotes and so forth, or pieces of other artists work you, you it's always good to get a legal edit for your work poor editing will be the number one complaint in reviews if you have it if you suffer from it and poor reviews equals poor sales and poor reviews equals a tarnished brand people will begin to think of you as the author who can't spell or the author who refuses to get their works um, professionally edited you know think about how many times you've read a book from a traditionally published author that had more than one or two typos in it it's pretty rare because they go quite through quite a few rounds of copy editing, line editing, proofreading, and so forth. And of course, I tell everybody when I give this talk at conferences, actually, editing really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter unless you want to sell more than one book. Because after you get your first few reviews that talk about how many editing mistakes you've made in your first 10 pages, you're not going to be able to sell many more books, because most people will catch those reviews and, and shy away from your book. Um, Justin, is there anything I missed here on why it's important to get a good edit of your book? What do you, what do you think? What, what else would you add to this list? Sure. <clears throat> well, I think um, one important thing to remember for any book, but especially fiction, um, is that you're, you have a sort of contract with your reader. Your reader is picking up your book. They're spending their hard-earned free time with your book, and they want to feel like their experience is about them. And anytime you have poor editing, glaring mistakes, you just make the reader feel like they're not that important to you. Like this is something you're doing for yourself and not for the reader. And that is a huge part of the contract, I believe. Okay, that's a good point. I hadn't really thought about that, about your, your you know, it's part of your brand promise. You create good entertainment and, 
I get it. Okay, so let's talk about the industry labels for editing. And um, hold on, did I miss a slide? Oh, okay, industry labels for editing. So, and this is there's actually two slides here. Um, I'm going to take these roughly in the order that they should probably occur in the life cycle of your book. Um, and it looks like this. The first one is what we would call developmental or project editing. And this is basically from the point where you might be writing a proposal to give to an agent to sell to a publisher. Uh, you don't actually have a book written, um, but maybe you've got a nonfiction proposal you'd like to sell, uh, or all the way through to a rough manuscript. So you, you might engage an editor to help plan your project, to decide you know, wh what's the contents, what's the order of the contents uh, if you've got a nonfiction book. If you've got a fiction book, you might take your, your, uh, your outline and uh, showing the character arcs and the, and the three-act nature of your work and the uh, conflict and so forth. And, and get a professional editor to look at that and say, okay, this looks like it makes sense. Now you have to put some nice prose around it. The next level of editing that you might engage an editor for is what's called substantive or structural or stylistic editing. And this is typically done after your, the, the rough draft of your manuscript is complete or, or maybe even you'd wait until you have a final draft done. And this is where an editor helps you um, really make what you've written more clear. Eliminate the jargon that's going to be unfamiliar to your audiences. They might suggest that you reorder content or reorder sequences in your in your fiction work. They're trying to help you improve the reading ability, make sure you match the reading level of your intended audience. So if you're writing a YA book or you're writing a business book, there's going to be a different reading target level there. They're also helping you with the consistency of voice. Not only your voice, but your character's voices as well. And then I talked earlier about a fact-checking or a legal edit. And this is where you ask an editor to go out and check the veracity of your quotes. Um, find out if, if there are some clear items in your book that require permission from another author to include or another artist to include in your book. Um, it might include fact-checking. It might, it might also, as I mentioned before, include a legal liability opinion. And then, of course, the last two levels that, that, that are probably the most common for the authors who are self-publishing their work is what we call line editing, or in some cases it's called copy editing. And this is typically done when the manuscript text is in its final, very final form. And this is where you ask an editor to go after your grammar and your punctuation and your spelling and the consistency of the mechanics of what you've done. They go sentence by sentence through your work. Uh, it can be a light copy edit. It can be a heavy copy edit. Uh, they'll also check your images and tables and addendums against the actual text to make sure that they match up. There are some editors who will include in this line edit uh, elements of a developmental or a structural edit. They might go back and make suggestions about, again, timeline or content or, or arrangement. Um, but, but just know that when you, are, when you, when you ask someone to, to perform a line edit for you or a copy edit for you, you know, know whether you're asking them to also pay attention to those things or not. And maybe you feel like you've got those all done and, and you want them to strictly focus at a, at a sentence level for you. And, of course, the last level of editing is proofreading. And proofreading is absolutely vital. In fact, I'd say proofreading uh, is, is, is most vital right before you hand off your work to the, the firm or the person or before you do it yourself, before you do the layout. And so the ebook layout and the interior layout for a print book and then you go on to do conversion. You want to make sure that before that handoff, your book is literally text perfect. Every single character, punctuation mark, everything is exactly the way you intended it as an author. And you've got all of the front matter, all of the back matter already created. So you got your forward, you got your epilogue, you got your uh, you got your fiction disclaimer, um, you got your half title page, you've got your introduction, you've got all of these items. Um, completely done and text perfect. Text perfect. Now, TK just wrote me a question. Says, if an author has editing issues in a published book, should they consider editing and republishing? So, I would say, uh, at TK, the short answer is, are they getting noticed? And if they are, I would immediately pull the book and consider having it re-edited, um, because if they're getting noticed, you have to remember the people who write reviews are typically. Uh, somewhere at the level of, of one in ten and one in a thousand of your readers. So if you're if if you've got you know five reviews that say 
uh, you've got editing problems in your book, you could have anywhere from, I don't know, uh, uh, five to 50 more people who noticed it but didn't write anything about it. But, they, but, it, but, but they're the ones who are out there not telling people to go buy your book because, frankly, they didn't have a great experience with it. Um, Justin, what would you say to TK's question? If, if, if an author has editing issues in a published book, should they consider editing it and republishing? What do you think? Am I off base? No, I mean, frankly, if you're going to write another book and you don't really want that other book out there influencing the way people are going to come to your next book, assuming, yeah, you definitely want to take control of that, I think. Yeah, and, you know, I, I'd even add to that, TK, um, that th there are more than a couple of studies that that um, uh, that confirm or at least postulate that or hypothesize that if your book has good reviews when your reader buys it, that actually puts your reader in a better frame of mind when they read your book, meaning they are more inclined to believe they are reading a good book than if there are no reviews or, of course, if there are poor reviews in aggregate. So, you know, if, if the editing issues you're having are dragging down the review performance of your book, I would positively pull it. Joan makes a comment. She says, you know, it's so easy to take down a book and re-edit it. Why would you not take it down and pay attention to that problem? And, and I agree, Joan. In the ebook world, you're absolutely right. It is easy to, to pull that book down, to make the edits, have it reconverted if you have to. Um, and in the, in the print-on-demand world, it's actually very easy as well. Uh, the only issue is, what if I went and had a short run, short print run done? I've got 500 books or 1,000 books, and I've got editing problems. Then you've got a tough question about, you know, do I dump them all or, um, or not? But that's really kind of beyond the scope of what we're doing today. So back to proofreading. So I said you want to have a text-perfect book before you begin in production, and I absolutely believe that. But there's actually another proof, uh, another a proofreading step, and that's after you get the book back uh, in its ebook format and in its print-on-demand format, but before you've put it up and said, make this available for my customers to purchase, you want to read through that book one more time and, and maybe have some other people read through it to make sure that no errors were introduced during the production process. Justin, is that common? I mean, am I, am I worried about the, something that's too small to be worried about, or is it not uncommon to introduce errors when you're doing print layout or, or doing ebook conversion? It is common. There's a lot that you have to look for. You know, the widows and orphans, which you mentioned in our first interview, uh, sometimes like the spacing around images kind of changes when you're doing that. Um, and then sometimes, anytime you're doing, you're using Word occasionally, there'll be like some uh, text artifacts that make it into Yep. So. Yeah, codes. I mean, I like those codes. Hey, remind me again, what are, in a, in a print book, what are widows and orphans? Widows and orphans are lines with only uh, one word on them, or like two words on them. Um, and one of, I, can't, I can never remember which one's which, but one of them is when they begin a page. It's just one word at the beginning, and the other is when they're alone on a single line. Got it. Okay, so... Um, essentially, it's a bad break on a paragraph, and you don't want to see that. Now, you know, there are, of course, you can't control that on an ebook because mm -hmm. the reader controls font size and reflowable text. You can't control that. You can, uh, but on print book, you definitely want to look out for that. Okay, so watch out for widows and orphans. Okay, great. So those are the five, you know, core kinds of labels, uh, four core kinds of editing that self-published authors typically get, and we'll talk about those in more detail. Why does every book need editing? I, pos I, I said this at the beginning as one of our conclusions. Well, what you'll find is that after the fourth or fifth or thirtieth rewrite of your book, you become blind to your own words, uh, even over after a few rewrites. In other words, you're so into the story, you're so thinking about where it should be going and what the character should be saying, that you're literally missing the errors that are in your own work. And And don't take this personally. This is not about whether you are a good writer or not, because, uh, frankly, good writers aren't necessarily good editors. Uh, if they were, we wouldn't need editors, because you'd already be good at it, be a, a component of being a good writer. Um, another reason you want to get a, at least a professional edit is that friends and, and family members, I call them family, family editors, they might be reluctant to point out major problems in your work. Sure, they'll find the spelling or grammar mistakes, but um, you know they may not be willing to tell you that the 
character arc isn't working for them or the conflict doesn't seem real or the dialogue seems too phony. Um, uh, when you use alpha readers and beta readers and critique groups, and they really represent an early focus group for testing and, and for editing of your book. Um, uh, they're a big benefit. They're, they're a big, you know, I recommend all the authors that can stand it. Um, use alpha readers, use beta readers, join a critique group. Justin, where, you know, if, if uh, some of our writers aren't familiar with critique groups, where do you, where do you find one? Well, how do you join a critique group for, I don't know, I like, I might try to write a science fiction novel. Where would I find one? Right. So last time we talked about this, somebody mentioned meetup.com, which we hadn't thought about. And uh, honestly, uh, Craigslist is always a really good place to go. Um, author forums, if you live in a big city, a lot of times your city will have a uh, public writer's workshop. Denver has one called uh, the Lighthouse Workshop, or Lighthouse Writer's Workshop. Uh, that's also a really good place. And uh, another place to look, I thought about this after our last interview, check your local university, um, especially if you're not that far out of that range, but even if you are, a lot of times they'll have clubs that will have events that are pretty good places to meet other writers. They have like creative writing clubs, basically, and all the people that attend their events are writers. It's a good place to meet writers. So. Yeah. I also uh, heard that occasionally libraries will put mm -hmm. together uh, writers' events, and that's a good place to go and try and find and join a, a critique group. I will tell you this. I've heard, I've been to a couple of uh, uh, writer meetups, and um, unfortunately, if you're like me and you write science fiction uh, and sometimes fantasy, you are the redheaded stepchild. Nobody wants you in their group because nobody, uh, nobody unless they're science fiction writers, nobody wants to read your stuff. Uh, that's just my own little beef. Um, uh, JJ drops a question here. She says, where do you get beta readers? Uh, now, let me define what I call a beta reader. So an alpha reader might be, um, and I'll give you an example. I was at a conference uh, two weekends ago with, with Hugh Howey, and he was, um, uh, Porter Anderson was interviewing him about uh, his writing and, and where he's come in just the last three years. And uh, he said his wife is his alpha reader. And for beta readers, he's got a couple of close friends and I think one fan um, who uh, have followed his work very, very closely. And uh, they are very good at reading it after he's revised it with his wife's comments. Um, Justin, any suggestions for JJ about where to uh, get beta readers? Uh, I mean, I think that anytime somebody is going to become a beta reader for you, then it's probably somebody who you've tested out with your work for a while. Um, I know I beta read for a couple people. Um, and it's just because of my experience reading their stuff before and tr gaining their trust over time and to the point where we just work something out. So uh, it's about, you know, developing. I uh, Justin, I lost you there for a minute. I don't know if everybody else heard you. It sounded like a rubber band sound and then you disappeared. But I think what you're talking about is the basic trust. Oh that you have to build up with a beta reader. And and uh, let me ask you this, Justin, for a beta reader, do I necessarily need an editor or another writer as my beta reader? Or do I need someone as my, uh, who's a member of my target audience? Or do I just need a friend who's willing to tell me like it is? What, what, what do you think? I think you need somebody patient. Uh, they're going to be reading something that is not in its final form. It might be closer to its final form than what your alpha reader read, but I think you need somebody who can defer judgment. Um, that's the most important thing for me in a beta reader because I know even between the alpha and the beta stages, there's still going to be a lot of problems and I, I want them to be able to focus on the right things. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, as far as whether you need an editor or a writer to be your beta reader, I don't think so, but the person who is your beta reader should be perceptive to the types of things that interest you as a writer. Mm -hmm. Am I looking for a certain kind of feedback or set of feedbacks uh, from an alpha reader, and then it's different from a beta reader, and it's different from my critique group, or, or is that really sort of very highly dependent personally what I'm trying to get out of it? Or, or does everybody look for the same set of things from each level of, of uh, engagement, or you know, is there any rule of thumb there? You just, I think you just have to kind of be aware of what you're issues are. I mean, I imagine that when you're talking to your beta readers, you're m most likely going to bring them 
you're going to ask them about problems that your alpha reader saw and try to make sure that those are cleared up. And you'll start ticking those off as you go through. And by the time you get to your you know, last edit, my friend who just had a, story, a short story collection come out, Simon & Schuster, he said his last round of editing was taking out an and that they had put in and adding back an and that they had taken out. <laughs> so it, it does get more and more focused as it goes along. Okay, great. And of course, there's more to editing than just grammar and spelling. We talked about this before. There's pacing, character development, uh, your voice, your character's voices, uh, timeline, um, conceptual development of your work, the reading level that it's at, um, and professional editing can help you with all of this. And of course, you know, I, I, I believe that professional editing will always improve the quality of your book. J Jason, uh, I'm sorry, Justin, do you have any counterexamples? Do you know of cases where someone went out and got a professional edit and it didn't improve the quality of their book? No. I mean, I imagine that there are probably situations where somebody worked with an editor for not enough time, um, not enough time for them to really get on the same page. Maybe there are times when an editor has the wrong idea about a certain part of your book, the end or the beginning. But as a writer, you have to be able to find you can't expect an editor to be perfect every single time. So you have to be able to find the things that they bring to you that work mm -hmm. for you, the things that don't. And you, you're almost always going to find a third way, um, especially for substantive editing. You're going sure. to find somewhere in the middle. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about how you can get your edit done for free. I mean, I think that's pretty important. I talk to a lot of authors who have a limited budget. And, and uh, of course, I always tell an author, you know, if you've got a limited budget, then I'd trade every single dollar that you've got in your marketing budget for a dollar of editing. Uh, I just think it's just that important. Um, but as we talked, you know, we talked a lot about how alpha and beta readers can be uh, part of your developmental or your structural or your stylistic edit uh, critique groups as well. Uh, Justin, what's your experience with critique groups? Are they getting into um, copy and line edit or are they staying high level? What? What's, or is every critique group different? What, what is there? Uh, what, what do we? What can we say about it? It's definitely person to person, um, and even when you even when you work with an editor, it's going to be person to person. If you you were talking about copy editing, and uh, I just wanted to mention then I didn't. If you just want to copy edit and you do not want your editor to make comments on story, it might be worth telling them. Um, that you're at that point in the book because some people just really can't help it and sort of both it goes uh, the same for critique groups. I know mm -hmm. that I tend to get way further into people's manuscripts than maybe than they, they want. would want for a critique group. So. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. So alpha, alpha, beta, alpha, and beta readers are good uh, potentially uh, for developmental editing uh, and substantive editing, structural editing. Uh, critique groups can be good for structural editing and possibly for line editing. And then when it gets down to, to more detailed copy editing and, and uh, proofreading, I have a suggestion that I give to all of our authors. Uh, and we have absolutely no connection to this company whatsoever. I just think they have the best tool out there. Um, it's a piece of software called, of all things, Editor. And it's by a company called serenity-software.com. And uh, the great thing is they've got a 10-day free trial. So you can go download the trial version of their software. Uh, when you do that, I highly recommend that you get the plug-in. It's a, now this is a piece of software that plugs in to Microsoft Word on the PC. So there's not a Mac version that I know about, so I'm sorry for all the Mac fans out there. Um, but when you get it, do the tutorial first. It's, the interface isn't great. It's the underlying engine that does a good job as a copy line editor, proofreader, it's not going to make major, um, uh, uh, major uh, rearrangement to the variety of your sentences, but it is going to dig into the words that you're using. Uh, and I have to tell you, every single author that I've talked to about this software who's gone out and used it, even if they just got the trial version and spent 10 days plowing through chapter after chapter of their book for free, has come back to me and said, wow, that was huge. I found a ton of things that, that everyone in my editing chain had missed. Uh, it may have actually even improved, improved my uh, word choice a little bit. 
Uh, many of them go on to buy the full version. If you get the full version, when you're checking out on their PayPal account, mention WaveCloud, and I believe that they will, after the, after the discount goes through, someone will come back in and manually give you a credit back for 10 or 15 percent of the purchase price of the software. At least that was the deal they had. We had, we they had going for us um, for our authors uh, a few months ago. So um, I just think it's a great piece of software. But I, I don't know if I have the last word on software. Justin, what are the other tools? Um, if I just you know I just can't afford a thousand dollar or two thousand or three thousand dollar edit of my work. What's some other software out there that you can recommend that'll help authors with this with this problem? Sure. Um, Personally, I don't think there's really a better program for like grammar than the program that you're talking about, Serenity's editor. Um, some other programs that I use just for, you know, generating um, ideas, generating drafts. Uh, I'm a poet, everybody, so my process might be a little bit different. I told everybody this before. So I use a program called Wordle, which is at wordle.net, which is a word cloud program and it pulls out all the words I've used the most. So it lets me just get a very basic idea of all my subjects, who my characters are maybe, um, and what I haven't written about, which is equally important. So you can mm -hmm. just look at a graphical representation, and if you think your book is about something, and then that word doesn't show up or it shows up very small, then you know that maybe you have to get back in there and work on it. Um, and then I also mentioned this morning the program Hemingway, which is a blunt tool, but sometimes it's uh, pretty interesting. It's a program that's supposed to make you write like Ernest Hemingway, and it will butcher your sentences, but it'll make you look at them in a new way. And that's half of the job of an editor, is just uh, making your own sentences new for you so you can see them the way that an audience member might. I think you said it takes all the adjectives and adverbs out. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And it'll tell you if you write any sentence that doesn't begin with I, it'll tell you to rewrite it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, perfect. Okay, great. Um, and, you know, the one other editing that I didn't list here, I meant to li list it, uh, is uh, one of the things that I think can successfully help authors is uh, perform your work. Literally read your work out loud, not just to yourself, but to a listener. Because when you do that, two things will happen. First of all, uh, you're using a different part of your brain to evaluate your work. It, it's the part of your brain that engages your speech centers. And when you're, when you're reading it out for someone, you are really going to focus on the words. And you're, you're pretty much guaranteed to stop a few times and make a few marks. Um, that's a pretty effective way of making sure that your word... Your word choice, your sentence variety, uh, and your word frequency uh, sounds right to an audience. Um, I know that Orson Scott Card, who wrote, of course, Ender's Game and that whole series, um, he actually got his start writing uh, radio scripts and screenplays, and he read everything out loud. And in fact, when you read his books, if you read them out loud, uh, they actually sound like a radio play. It's been a very effective editing method for him as well. Okay, so now let's move on to uh, an editing tool. So let's say you engage an editor, whether that editor is a friend, a family member, or, um, or a professional editor. Uh, professional editors especially are going to want to use a common tool with you. Uh, the days of, of sort of taking a double-spaced manuscript and, and zipping it back and forth and rewriting it and reprinting it are, are, for the most part, gone, unless that's the way that you must do it. I strongly recommend that you use... Microsoft Word's uh, track changes feature. And so every, of course, every edition of Microsoft Word is a little bit different. Uh, the ribbon bar, I think I'm using Microsoft Word uh, 2010 here, uh, essentially shows you, oh, I didn't click the right review. Oh, so sorry. Um, I meant to catch the right ribbon bar. I grabbed the wrong one. If I had clicked the review menu item up here on the ribbon bar, it would have shown you all the great stuff. But this is what it looks like if you're not familiar with the track changes settings in Microsoft Word. Um, so when the when it's crossed out, when new words are entered, you can tell what is the editor suggested here that I get rid of or change. Uh, you can add comments like little balloon comments up in the side, uh, and then as you go through, you can accept each each one of the changes one by one, or you can accept them all. It makes for a very efficient efficient 
collaboration effort uh, between uh, a writer and an editor. So um, it's probably, you know, Microsoft Word is terrible for a lot of things. This happens to be something that it's very good at. And of course, Word is, uh, it's this, this particular feature in Word is compatible between the Mac and the PC. So even if you're on one platform and the editor is on another, you should still be able to exchange information like this. Let's talk about editing expectations. And the very first one is, uh, and I'd say these top two are, are more important than anything else, is that you have the final say, right? It's your voice, it's your work, your name is going on this book, and ultimately you do not have to take all the suggestions of your editor. Uh, you can ignore them, uh, ignore them at your, at your peril or ignore them for great reasons or for bad reasons, but fundamentally you have to remember that you are in charge, you are in control. And remember, when you engage the editor, these changes, these suggested changes, they're not about you as a person or your skill as a writer. They're about your book, and they're about improving your book. Um, usually the editing process is going to take time. You're going to go back and forth a couple of different passes uh, uh, with the book, and it's going to require rewriting work by you, not usually not by the editor. Now, professional editing is uh, more expensive, but it will produce a better book. Um, when, you, when you engage a professional editor, both you and she, you and he, you both need to know what to expect. So have a written contract, interview, check references. Um, make sure you provide your editor uh, a sample, sample 10 pages or a chapter, whatever they want, because they need to get a feel for who you are before they engage with you. If you find an author that says, oh, you know, I'll do it, um, I'll do it uh, for some fixed price, and they have never read your work, your current work in progress, you should be very wary. Also, there's a site out there, you can Google it, it's called Predators and Editors. And it's a great site to help you uh, get a feel for uh, your editor and their reputation. You know, it's probably good if your uh, editor isn't listed on the site, uh, but if they are listed, you, you're going to want to drill into those comments and see what people have had to say. Um, it, it's, uh, this is an area where there's been some fraud in this industry, so every, every author should exercise business judgment and caution. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of wonderful edit, editors out there especially as larger publishers have downsized. A lot of editors have become available as freelancers. You can get the same editors that have done blockbusters and bestsellers um, throughout the world, and uh, you can get them to work on your book. It's just a matter of digging and finding the right one for you. Remember, most writers aren't good editors of their own work. So um, when you're out there looking for an editor, you're looking for a partner. Justin, anything you'd add to that? Yeah, something that I was just thinking about. We tend to think about editors as uh, tearing down, as constantly tearing down and looking for weaknesses that you don't see. But you know it's just as likely that your editor is going to see strengths in your manuscript that you don't see, see places to expand in your manuscript that you don't see. Um, and the other thing, uh, it is true that you don't have to accept the changes and it is true that you have the final say. Um, and that is important. The other important thing that I would say from my own experience is even when people have gotten their corrective suggestions maybe wrong on my manuscripts, it has almost always turned out that they've still diagnosed something underneath that correctly, um, some underlying problem that I wouldn't have noticed otherwise. So they might have found a problem, they might have given the wrong prescription to fix it, but they've uncovered a problem with their comment is what you're saying. Yes, correct. Okay, okay. Interesting. All right, great. Um, okay, working with a professional editor. So, so let's say you decide to take the plunge, you find one, you interview him or her, check their references, you get a contract. What's that look like? Well, you know, one of the things I would say is before you engage an editor, before you send a sample, before you send your first set of work out to them to start this relationship, I would uh, do everything possible to pre-edit your work. And the reason is simple. You're hiring a professional editor to provide value, and you want them to provide the most value. And correcting uh, your spelling is not providing the most value. Finding homophones is not providing the most value. You really want to knock all of that stuff out of your work and let your professional editor really focus on the stuff that's going to make the most 
improvement in your work. I highly suggest working with your editor against timelines and deadlines and milestones. Um, have a contract with milestones set up in it, and maybe you pay out by the milestones. Now, of course, contracts can be fixed fee. They can be hours-based, word-based, page-based. Um, and, you know, if you do a page-based uh, uh, contract with an editor, make sure that, that you and the editor are using the same definition of a page. In the editing world, a standard page is uh, eight and a half by 11. It's double-spaced. It's got normal margins. In fact, I think it may even have slightly larger margins than normal. It's in 12-point Times New Roman font. Um, I think you were saying earlier today, Justin, that uh, you tell authors you have a little different rule of thumb for pages. What is it? Yeah, I tell them to take their word count and divide it by 350 to get a good idea. And the reason for that is books with a lot of dialogue, that sort of thing, that tends to throw off. You might end up paying a lot more if you do page base rather than dividing it by 350 to get what your pages are. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And maybe words without a lot of dialogue, it's 250. But anyway, you negotiate that with the editor, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, right. great. And then, I, of course, I mentioned this before, check the references before hiring. Make sure they're real. Check predators and editors. And, and by the way, here's a, just a courtesy for your editor. Um, ask if they want editing credit in the book. And they may say, well, let's wait till the end. Or they may say, absolutely, I'd love it. Um, and if they do want editing credit, I, I would strongly recommend granting it, especially when you put it in your metadata, because... Um, uh, that can help with discovery for your book. It can help you make your look more, more your book look more professional in its listing on Amazon or in Bowker. So definitely uh, find an editor that wants to take credit for helping you produce a great work. I would definitely absolutely add that to the list. All right, so we're getting near the end. What does this cost? Well, of course, editing <laughs> uh, editing pricing like editing skill varies. Uh, there are there are, and Justin, I meant to ask this this morning. What are the professional standards out there, or certifications out there for editors? How do I know I've got someone who's qualified to edit my work? I would just, for me personally, I would look at their um, resume and just see what they've see what they've edited before. I mean, actually look at the the exact manuscripts they've edited in the past. Mm -hmm. That's what I would bet at, bet at them. Okay, and you know while we're talking about that, t tell me, um, do editors specialize, and do I want an editor that specializes in science fiction, if I'm or in diet books, or in public speaking, or business transformation, or romance? I mean, what's what's the and or do I want an editor that specializes in a certain type of editing? So maybe I'll have four different editors for my book. But what's that look like? Sure, I think. For a book, you do you do want to try to get somebody that has as much specific knowledge about your specific project as possible. Um, if you're writing science fiction, you probably do need somebody to let you know when you get outside of the expectations of science fiction. If you're writing romance, you probably do need somebody to remind you when you've left something out that seems crucial to the romance genre. Oh yeah, the first kiss. Oh yes, oh yes. Uh, as far as the uh, multiple layers of editing, that does tend to go on. Um, if you have a book, your manuscript will have a main editor, but at the same time, um, this is uh, with mo the main publishing companies, your agent will be editing your book, your editor will be editing your book, and there will be interns that they do not pay to fact check your book. Um, you'll have a lot of people on the on the project because it's a huge, ideally it would be a huge money maker for them. So they're investing mm -hmm. into it. Mm -hmm. So it's possible to have multiple editors uh, on my book if I'm traditionally published. Uh, that might be more expensive if I'm self-publishing. So I really want to focus on the areas. Is it is it is there any sort of rule of thumb that says if I'm a really good line editor, I'm typically not a great developmental editor or, or a structural editor? Or no, not really. It just depends on the person. Yeah, I think it depends on the person. I know more people who have the developmental skill and not the line editing skill mm -hmm. than people who have the line editing editing skill and that somehow keeps them from having the developmental skill. It seems like sometimes your real creatives might be a little loopy, but yeah, okay. I don't think that, that, that there's anything uh, 
any hard rule that you can get to on that. All right, got it. Okay, so so when you put together a professional editing relationship, it's 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 usually either, of course, a fixed price contract or typically a page per hour based contract. And fixed price, you know, that you send the editor your sample, and maybe they want ten pages, maybe they want three pages, maybe they want a chapter. You tell them how long the work is going to be, and then they give you a quote. And the and the quote. You know, make sure you're really clear with your editor. The quote is uh, based on the length of this, the expected length of this work, and the quote is based on, I want structural and line editing uh, and then proofreading. Or, you know, I, I want you to make four passes through the book. Pass number one is developmental. Pass number two is structural, so on and so on and so forth. Um, of course, then there's a, the, the other method is typically a variable deal where it's by the hour. And, uh, for example, I took these, these uh, prices off of the Editorial Freelancers Association website, and I put that link down here. Um, for basic copy editing, we're talking, uh, you're typically going to get a, a, a quoted rate at 5 to 10 pages an hour at 30 to $40 an hour. For heavy copy editing, it's going to be 2 to 5 pages an hour. Now, 5 pages is, for heavy copy editing, super fast, right, Justin? It's, it's going to be rare to find somebody who's moving that fast with heavy copy Yeah, that's, that's really booking it, no pun intended. <laughs> that's funny okay and then the proofread you know they're going to do nine thir nine to 13 pages an hour 30 to 35 dollars an hour now of course this doesn't mean that every editor found on the editorial freelancers association is going to work to this rate chart but just so you get a sense this is what they're suggesting to their members that they charge to clients um, of course your mileage is going to vary depending on the experience of the editor how hungry they are what projects they have in the pipeline um, again, I'm, I'm going to recommend that you find that site, Predators and Editors. You check it out, and you make sure that whoever you think you're working with uh, isn't on that list in a bad way. Uh, two good starting resources. Now, of course, there are English language editors all around the world. Uh, we've used some from New Zealand uh, and Australia. Um, I don't know if I'm quite ready yet to use one from India, but uh, two good places to start are the Editorial Freelancers Association, uh, that's mostly made up of editors in the United States <clears throat> and the Editors Association of Canada. Um, where else would you suggest, Justin, that we look for an editor? That's a good question. Uh, those are definitely the best. I think um, I go to poets and writers sometimes, and they have a little. Uh, they have an article that they have agents and editors write once a week. Mm -hmm. I follow that, and I, if I see any editor that I like on that, I kind of get interested in it and then also I if you ha if you have a friend who has an editor that's kind of a good way as mm -hmm. well I have some friends who have you know their own personal editors at their publishing houses and so I imagine that's going to to be a uh, of benefit to me when it's time to publish my book so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you know that you, you remind me of course as well Justin that if I've got a great I'm, let's say I'm writing science fiction so I'm trying to write my first science fiction novel and I want a really good science fiction editor. Hey, lo and behold, maybe I should go take a look at the science fiction editors credited in the books that I really enjoy reading. Mm -hmm. Right? So maybe I ought to go try to find Hugh Howey's editor um, and and people like that. So usually the, those editors are credited in the book, either uh, in the metadata or I actually have to buy the book and or, or do the look inside function in Amazon so I can see the first 10 pages or so and, and usually at least get through there to find out how the editor is credited. Um, that's probably a good way to find an editor as well, I think. Let's see. Uh, JJ's got a question here. Do you have to worry about pay issues with Canadians when you're in the U.S., conversion rates, taxes, et cetera? So, uh, JJ, my best guess is that's uh, sort of the contractual deal, um, especially if you can find an editor that will take PayPal. Uh, you can let PayPal and uh, worry about all that. Uh, they'll take out the appropriate taxes and, then, of course, uh, sales taxes if there are any for services. I don't know in Canada how that works. Um, uh, and of course, the the uh, the editor in Canada can take out their own income taxes, but I think a pay the pay the payment service, whatever you use to pay, should be able to take care of that for you. Okay, great. So let's circle back around to our final recommendations. Uh, every book needs to be edited before it's published, um, whether you you go the the free or the nearly free route, or you hire a professional editor. Again, I would trade uh, a marketing dollar for an editing dollar. Uh, any day, because I think that uh, when you're building your brand as a writer, having a professionally edited work is very, very valuable. You need to know 
the industry language for editing levels. We talked about that uh, in some detail. Uh, and if you missed those slides, I saw that we had some people join a little bit late. Again, I'm happy to send those. I'll go back to my email address for you. Or if you want, just throw your email address in the questions box, and I'll make sure that I send your I send the uh, the slides out to you. Um, editing can be nearly free. We talked about how you do that. Um, there are a couple of good pieces of software that we talked about. Um, so really, your your excuses are narrowing quickly uh, for not doing an edit before you send your book out. Um, when you work with an editor, uh, we recommend uh, doing it electronically. It's just so much faster, and and it, it reduces the chances of adding more errors into the book uh, if you use the Microsoft Word uh, track changes feature uh, in common with your editor. Uh, we talked about your expectations about editing. Mostly, you know, think about your editor as your partner. They're not trying to tear you down. Um, they're trying to help you build a better book. Um, we talked about how to work with an editor, you know, get your book truly as self-edited as you can before you send it out so that your editor is focusing on the areas that add the most value. That's what you're paying for. And then we talked about a couple places to find editors and, and what it might cost. Um, you can do the math on how many words you've got divided by how many pages, uh, uh, divided, uh, multiplied by number of hours times rate. Uh, you can get a feel for professional edit is expensive. It's a true investment in your book. Now I want to uh, throw it open for questions, uh, uh, and I actually want to throw a couple polls out there. So let me do the first poll real quick. We're trying to narrow down uh, uh, how we'd like, uh, how long we'd like these webinars to be. We've had some suggestions that we run some shorter ones, and I'd like to just get a quick uh, opinion from the group who's attending today. Click on one of these buttons, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour or longer, uh, and let me know how long you'd like to see a webinar on a given topic. Now, of course, the less time we have, the less detail we can go into, um, but maybe that also makes it easier to pay attention. And um, just give me a, a quick vote there and let me know what you think. It looks like uh, we've got uh, not quite 20% uh, of the vote in. If everyone could just take a moment and give me a quick vote. Tell me what you think about how long these are and how we should make them longer or shorter. I'd appreciate it very much. We've got almost everybody. I think we've got... Uh, one person gone. Okay, so I'll show you that. It looks like, the, I'll show you the results of that just for fun. It looks like it's about half and half, some like an hour, some like 30 minutes. Um, so I'll definitely take that in consideration. Thank you very much. Let me ask you one more quick poll while we're doing this. Um, How did you hear about today's webinar? Um, we're trying to figure out what's effective for us when we're, um, when we're marketing. So uh, did you hear about us at a conference? We were at uh, the conference in Charleston. Uh, two weekends ago where we told people about these. Uh, maybe you got an email blast from us or a referral or social media notice. Give me a quick vote and let me know what you, looks like we've got everybody voted. Thank you very much. I'll just show the results. It's always good to see everybody voted and you can get a feel for how everybody heard about it. So thank you everybody. Appreciate that. So I positively want to throw it open to questions. Um, uh, Brian, I see your question. Uh, you want me to send the slides? I'll absolutely send them to you. Um, that's not a problem. Uh, anyone else have any other questions for me or for Justin about stuff uh, related to editing? We're happy to take them going once. And if, if you're trying to figure out where to put them in, there should be on your uh, side panel when you expand it, there should be a section there for questions. If you hit the plus sign and open it up, you can type a question in if you'd like. Well, I don't think we have any more questions. You are welcome to email me. Uh, I'll forward it to Justin if you've got a question for him. We'll try and get it answered. Uh, we want to do everything we can to help authors be successful. Thanks, everybody, for joining us this evening. We really appreciate it. Have a great rest of your evening. Again, sometime around midnight tonight, you'll receive an email with a link to this webinar. If you want to catch a re-recording of it, uh, it'll be available for you anytime on demand. Thanks again. Take care.